Hi, welcome to this presentation on the modified Angoff method. I'm Nathan Thompson, and I'm the Vice President of Psychometrics at Assessment Systems Corporation, and I'm going to talk about how the modified Angoff approach can help you set cut scores that are sound and defensible, as well as helping your exam provide the information that your stakeholders need. First of all, uh, what is standard setting? Well, standard setting refers to the process of setting standards, also known as cut scores, um, for how to interpret test scores. And there's many different ways of applying standards and interpreting test scores, but the most recognizable that we're mostly all familiar with is pass and fail. And there's a number of methods for establishing this pass-fail cut score as well as standards, setting standards in general, uh, and we'll be discussing those in another video. Uh, today we're going to just focus on one of the most common approaches known as the modified Angoff approach. The goals of the modified Angoff approach are to, first of all, set a defensible cut score, that is, one that is uh, both defensible both from a legal perspective and that meets the requirements of international standards such as AARA, APA, NCME, or NCCA or ANSI if you're a credentialing program. And we want to do this by utilizing subject matter experts because we have a lot of expertise to use it from the stakeholders. And we're going to focus on content rather than examinees. There are some standard setting approaches that focus on the examinees rather than the content such as borderline methods or contrasting group methods where you deliver your test to a pilot sample and utilize data from that pilot sample. The, one of the advantages of the modified Angoff approach is that it does not require you to actually deliver your test to any examinees before you set the cut score. You can do so and it actually can help make your cut score even more defensible by adding on a, another layer of quality control over the Angoff approach, but it's not required. The modified Angoff approach follows uh, the general process that you see outlined here. The first thing you need to do is define a minimally competent candidate. So usually what happens here is that we gather a panel of subject matter experts, SMEs, and sit them in a room or on a webinar and tell them they need to decide what a minimally competent candidate is. That is, they want to determine what is the minimal type of person that we want to pass the exam that we're building here. So for example, if you're providing some sort of medical assistant exam, you might have a group of doctors and clinic managers get together in a room and say, okay, here's the type of assistant exam we're proposing here. What do you think are the skills that this person needs to barely be qualified to fill this role in your clinic, but not be advanced enough to move to more advanced roles? Then what you need to do is train the subject matter experts, and what they're going to train them on is the fact that they need to go through each item in the test and rate the item on the percentage of MCCs that would get this item correct. The key point here is that it's would and not should, because uh, they'll often think of people that they work with or the things that they really need to know in their clinic or, or if they're professors or some other instructor, they think of the stuff that they teach and they really focus on, um, but they don't recognize that this could be different with other instructors or other clinics or other situations. Then what you usually do is rate a few example items and discuss this with your SMEs to make sure that they're all kind of calibrated together. And then when they're ready to go, you send them off to rate all the form, all the items on the form, or all the items in a pool if there's going to be multiple forms being built out of a pool of items. Then you analyze the results of this first round of ratings and identify items that have poor agreement. We want to increase the consensus on these items with poor agreement and thereby increase the iterator reliability. In a rate of reliability refers to a single number that on a scale of 0 to 1 of how well the raters are kind of coalescing into consensus. And we'll often do a second round of ratings then based upon the discussions on the items of the poor agreements. If you have some data available regarding how uh, examinees will likely perform on the test, you can use what's called the Pew Compromise, and I'll provide details on that later in the, the slides. So how do we actually gather these ratings? Well, usually what you're going to do is ask the SMEs to input them into a spreadsheet or on paper and then collate it. And this is the traditional method of uh, approaching this process. You know, before the days of the internet, they would show items up on a, a projector screen in the middle of the room and all the raters would write their ratings down on a piece of paper and then you'd collate it at the end and try to quick enter it into a spreadsheet so you could analyze the data. Uh, but nowadays we've got the internet and you can do this sort of work directly in an item banker. Uh, item bankers that are sufficiently powerful will have review functionality where these SMEs can just log in from anywhere, see the items in a, in a test form or a pool, and there will be some sort of functionality for them to say, hey, leave your hang rating here. Uh, you can also do it by having them take the test in a test delivery platform and recording their ratings in a special field. 
For example, if a test delivery platform has a comments field, which uh, my company's does, and you could, they can just go through, take the test, and leave their ratings in the comment field. Now these meetings here can be in person or they can be virtual. What I mean here is that traditionally, like I said, usually we'd fly in SMEs into a room and you'd present items up on a projector. Uh, but nowadays, with the power of the internet and webinars, these items, these meetings can be virtual. And there's some interaction that is lost in these, um, but the cost savings can be massive, um, so which is why uh, many organizations utilize that approach. Then what do you do with these ratings once you have them? Well, the easiest thing to do is just calculate the average rating. And the average rating, if you think about it, then it, that is going to be the expected score for an MCC, because that's the average number of percent correct that this panel of subject matter experts is expecting a minimally competent candidate to get correct on this test. And therefore, it's the panel recommended cut score. And that's the, the term that is often used here, is panel recommended. You can also look at these ratings to evaluate their inter-rater reliability, and that's one of the, the key points. And you can also look at rater means, item means, and item standard deviations. For example, you might check to see that rater 3 has really high average, and find that rater 7 has a really low average, meaning that uh, rater 3 has really high expectations of the examinees, and thinks they should be getting a lot of the questions right, whereas rater number 7 has little lower expectations of the examinees, and is setting a lower cut score. Uh, if you're looking at the item means, the item means tell you which items the raters are considering more difficult or much less difficult. And you can also look at the item standard deviations, which is useful for determining which items have the most and least amount of agreement. Because if the standard deviation of ratings for a single item is very high, it means that the raters' ratings vary widely, um, and they're not agreeing very much. And you might isolate those items for discussion as part of the second round. So a key strategic step here is not just to look at these statistics by themselves, but to use them to drive the discussions as part of the second round, because that is going to make your uh, cut score more defensible by increasing the consensus surrounding the cut score. So here's an example with a, a very small situation of six raters rating a set of ten items. And we've gone through the first round, and you can see that they left the ratings here. So we looked at the first item, and rater number run gave it a 65. And usually what you'll see here is that ratings like this, um, the segmentations that run these typically don't tell people to worry about quibbling over the individual numbers in terms of 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Just round it to a level of 5 or 10 and move on, otherwise you could spend all day thinking about it. So rater number 1 rated the first item 65, rater number 2 rated the first item 40, rater 3 gave it a 60, rater 4 gave it a 95, rater 5 gave it a 40, and rater 6 gave it a 60. And you notice there was definitely some variation here. Rater number 5 thought this was a pretty difficult item, and only 40% of the MCCs are going to get it right. Whereas rater number 4 thought it was a really easy item, and thought that 95% of the MCCs are going to get it right. And then they continued with this process through the next 9 items, and got the spreadsheet like you see here. And if you were to calculate the average of all these ratings, it comes out to being a cut score of 6.58 out of 10 points. And the inner rater reliability out of this is 0.312, which if you're familiar with the reliability indices, 0.312 is not very strong. So then let's suppose we isolated a couple items out of this that required some further discussion, and we got some raters to change the ratings as part of uh, that process. So here's the results of round two, and just to keep it simple here, we only changed three ratings out of uh, the 60 that you see in the grid. Uh, rater number 4 is rating to item number 1, which went from a 95 down to a 65. And rater number 6 changed their results on two items, number 3 and number 10, gave them both 65s. And you can see here that it hardly affected the cut score at all. The cut score only changed to 6.52. However, the uh, inner rater reliability is now 0.684. That's more than double what it was on the previous screen, even though we only changed three ratings out of the grid of 60 which shows you how much leverage is provided by ratings that are out of line with everybody else's. That also shows just how useful this two-round approach is to providing greater consensus regarding your cut score. By taking the, you know, 10, 20 minutes even, just to give feedback on these three items and have three ratings change, not even amongst all six raters, just two raters, one changes one rating, one changes two ratings, greatly increased our inner reliability. 
You can also, as part of this process, use item statistics. That is, if you have them, if, you know, if your items have been delivered in the past and you've got statistics on how many people actually got them right, you can use them here. The best practice is not to show them on every item, or the subject matter experts will always be lazy and just converge on the P. You know, they might discuss one item, and then someone will be like, oh, let's look to see what how many people actually got it right, and they see, oh, it was 71%, and they all kind of go around 70% then, even though they aren't actually looking at the item, focusing on the content item like they should. So, what is often suggested is that the item statistics, if you have them, only be presented every 5 or 10 items. So if you've got 100 items, you only want to present statistics on maybe 10 of them. So it's an occasional reality check to keep the raters aligned with each other and with reality, but you're still getting them to focus primarily on the content of the items. Now, like we said before, this is going to leave you with a panel recommended cut score, and that is often very useful by itself, especially if you've got some good consensus regarding the iterator reliability. But the experts that serve on panels like this often forget what it's like to be a new person in the field. That is, it, you might be an expert physician or clinic manager with 20 or 30 years of experience, and you don't see the world from the point of view of a new medical assistant that is fresh out of college or university. So what will often happen is you'll see some sort of situation like this. They came up with a panel recommended of cut score of 75, which seems pretty reasonable, but based on some past data you have, you expect the average score for candidates to be 70 with a standard deviation of 5. Well, this means that you're only going to have about a 15% pass rate on the exam, because the cut score is well above the average expected score. And to make matters worse, if you ask the SMEs how many people should pass the exam, they say, yeah, after reviewing all the items, we think it's pretty easy. 85% or so should pass. Well, uh, if you're familiar with the normal curve, mean of 70 and a standard deviation of 5, that would mean a cut score of 65, rather than the 75 that they just recommended by using the Angoff process. So there's a pretty wide gap here between what they set with the Angoff process and what they really expect to have happen. Um, based upon real data from examinees. So we need to try to find some sort of happy medium here, and that's what the Butte Compromise is exactly designed to do. So the Angoff only approach might provide a cut score of 75 and a pass rate of 15, and if you ask them what the pass rates should be, they think the pass rate should be 85, which would lead to a cut score of 65. Well then the Butte Compromise should say, no, the cut score should probably be somewhere in the middle. Let's just say it for simplicity's sake here, it's a cut score of 70, which would give us a pass rate of about 50%. Uh, the actual calculations that go into calculating the buke are fairly complex, but the general concept remains the same here, is that we're trying to find a compromise between looking at the Angoff ratings only, and with what people are thinking are going to happen with the pass rates. Now, there's one possible hang-up here, and that's you need some way to estimate what the mean and standard deviation of the student scores are. The easiest thing is to pull actual data from a pilot sample. So if you've uh, developed your items, delivered them to a pilot sample to get some idea of how they're performing, and then you're doing the Angoff study now, and you, you know, you've got, let's say, data on 30, 40 people from last month, well, let's take the average score of those people and use that as the plug-in for the Butte Compromise. Uh, you can also take the P and RP biz for each item, uh, proportion correct and point by serial correlation. These can be used to estimate the mean standard deviation reliability of a test form uh, without having any actual student data on yet, just using those item statistics alone. And of course, you can also make the SMEs take the test, um, and that's one way to really give them a reality check, because they might set the cut score at 75, like we just talked about, and you find that even the SMEs have an average score of 73 which is below what they expected for the cut score. Uh, so that would be a huge reality check for the SMEs and might indicate that they need to go back and do a complete round three in the Angoff ratings because their expectations are so unrealistic it doesn't even apply to them as the experts. So now suppose we've got a final cut score and, and you want to apply it. Well, the final cut score from the Angoff and the Buke method is on the raw points metric. And if you're delivering a test that's being scored on a raw points metric, that is, you're just summing up the number of items people got correct, well, then you can just go ahead and apply that as part of your test delivery platform. If you're using item response theory or computerized adaptive testing, I or T or CAT, you need to convert this cut score to the theta metric. And that's actually fairly easy to do. If you've got the test response function from your item parameters, you can just plug it in there and reverse engineer it. So in the graph you see right here with this 30-item test, 
suppose that your Angoff cut score came out to be 20 points out of 30. Well, if you look at where the blue line crosses the 20 point line and you drop a line down to the x-axis, you'll see that's about 0 0.20 on the x-axis. So that would mean that your cut score on the theta would be 0 0.20. Now, what do you do uh, to actually apply this? How do you perform these calculations, and how do you write this up in a report? Because if you're, again, if you're trying to meet accreditation standards, what they'll often do is require you to write a formal report that details everything about this process. How many raters you got, what was their background, how did you train them, what's the definition of the MCC, what were the ratings in round one and round two, what was the inner rater reliability and the buke in both rounds, what items were reviewed, that sort of thing. And there's a lot of work that can go into this. The traditional approach to do this is to just throw it out into an Excel spreadsheet and quick calculate what you need to do. That requires then a lot of copy and paste to get that into a Microsoft Word report. If you're interested, ASC provides the Angoff Analysis Tool, which is an Excel spreadsheet that automates the key calculations that you need to run a modified Angoff study. But you still have to go through that copy and paste process to develop a report. Uh, if you want to become even more efficient, you can automate the process in general using our Ada platform. The Ada platform allows users to leave their Angoff ratings there, and a click of the button will give you a draft of this Angoff report, including uh, the ratings that was used, the integrated reliability, and everything else already with narratives there. And you can take that and add on whatever else you need to, such as your rater backgrounds. That greatly facilitates the development of the final report, which makes it a lot easier to, from a cost and time perspective, to develop a cut score that is legally defensible, as well as meeting accreditation standards. If you'd like to learn more about this process, we've got some further resources at assess.com, as you see there. Just go to that Angoff Analysis tool page and you'll learn more about it. The manual that comes with it provides a lot of information about how to interpret the results. Now, this video that we provided here is intended as a, an overview so that you can understand what the Angoff process is and how it can help you develop a cut score in a way that focuses on content while also being as quantitative as possible. And if you would like any questions to me, or if you're interested in using our consulting services to perform an Angoff study for your organization, uh, we can certainly do that also. Uh, visit assess.com and fill out one of the contact forms there, and one of our experts will be getting in touch. Thank you for watching this video, and I look forward to providing some more instructional videos on principles of psychometrics. Thank you. Bye.